trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hello, hello, listeners and viewers. My name is William von der Palen. I'm here at the Helsinki Slush office. Yet another podcast episode coming up. And uh, today, our guest is Emily Orton, uh, CMO of Darktrace. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, William. Very nice to to have you here. Um, let's start out with the basics. Who is Emily Orton? Well, uh, great question. Um, so I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Darktrace. Um, I've been with the company since it founded, so I'm part of the co-founding team. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit about Darktrace as well, because I'm sure you want to hear about that. Um, so Darktrace is a cybersecurity company. We're based in Cambridge. And we were actually the first company to develop AI uh, back in 2013 when we, when we founded that was capable of interrupting in progress cyber attacks inside a company systems. So my journey has been um, going from the very early days, setting, setting that company up through to today, um, where um, so, some of you may know that their dark trace uh, recently floated on the London Stock Exchange. Um, but a bit of background, I guess, to, to kind of where we come from, I'm guessing, um, uh, you know, you might want to hear about the founding story, right? And um, what was interesting about when we started Dark Trace was the whole approach to doing um, cybersecurity um, was based on this idea of having a wall around your network, keeping bad actors off your systems altogether. And so the whole industry was built, built around this fundamental principle of keeping the bad guy off. Now, today, that whole approach is discredited. It doesn't work. Uh, and the reason for that is people are on your systems all the time. Your employees need to get into your systems. Your customers are connecting to your networks. Today, we have remote working. We have so many ways of um, you know, interacting with data, which is great, uh, but it also makes us very vulnerable. So we really came in with this question of how do you actually deal with a situation where the bad guy can get in? In fact, in many cases, when we start working with organizations, we find that the bad actor, the threat is inside already. And so it was a really different way of looking at the problem of security and looking at how uh, a technology like AI could be used to overcome that. Yeah. No, for sure, and it's uh, it's a massive problem the, the cybersecurity part. And it, it the little I know about it, it seems that even though you have the perfect security system set up and and you know all your servers duct taped and and whatever, it always boils down to you know personal like one one uh, one person doing something maybe a bit stupid, something a bit naive, or getting tricked into doing something and then uh, granting access to to someone to the system. So it. It seems very inevitable to, to keep everyone out uh, of the systems entirely um, at, at this point. Uh, but what about your background? Um, how did you end up uh, co-founding Darktrace? Well, it's really interesting because um, I am a um, uh, linguist by background. I did French and Spanish literature. Um, and so how did I get into technology? So it's a really great question because it's not an obvious route. Uh, and certainly if you go you know, across Europe, I remember sort of, you know, traveling, you know, France and Spain, I did time, time out there. You know, it's almost that pathway seems kind of strange. And I think, as I said, particularly when I traveled you know, the rest of Europe, it's kind of like, you're a literature graduate. How did you, how did, how did that happen? Um, so let me explain. Well, I guess, you know, I think it's really important for employers to be really um, sort of open in the way they hire. And I think this is something I'm sure we'll get onto in our conversation is hiring. But I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to work, you know, within a technology company at the beginning of my career. Um, and Darktrace was actually um, a company that was founded out of Cambridge, which was it is a very sort of rich ecosystem in terms of technology. It's somewhere where I actually studied. And so I was quite close to the Cambridge ecosystem and started working in Cambridge Um, companies from the beginning of my career um, and you know at the beginning at Dark Trace you know I didn't know where it was going necessarily but 
what I did know is that there were some really, really bright um, people behind it. Uh, we were founded by mathematicians coming out of the university, coming out of that science space in Cambridge. And so what attracted me as someone who, uh, you know, enjoys communicating, enjoys trying to translate ideas into concepts that are going to be compelling was firstly, it was a massive challenge. It's a massive challenge working with people that whose brains work in a very different way to yours. Um, so I really liked being part of, uh, of, of adding something that was different and unique to clearly some very um, serious brain power. Um, we have PhDs in, in physics, you know, computing, um, uh, statistical modeling. Those are kind of uh, sort of really kind of pure um, scientific uh, disciplines and, and translating that. So I, I started um, right in the early days um, building up um, that sort of initial kind of uh, communication strategy and, and, you know, eight years on, um, I'm now sort of leading a, a sort of global division within that. So it's, it's definitely been a lot of learning in my career in terms of um, how technology works, how science works. And I definitely, you know, I love to encourage, um, you know, people coming out of universities in these broader subjects. You don't need a business degree to do business. You know, that is the reality. What you want is someone who is... Um, capable, who's creative, who has, you know, ability to think laterally around a, a problem. And you you really want to give those people the ability to learn. And so that's something that's really important at Dark Trace is, you know, getting capable people and allowing them to learn on the job. And that's something very much that I've done. Yeah, no, exactly. And it seems to me that uh, that's more common in Britain, for instance, than in many other European countries where you study humanism or, or you know, you can be a historian, work as a lawyer or, or whatnot. So it seems like it's working yeah. at least for, for Britain. It's probably something that should be more more and more common also given the world we, we live in uh, at the moment. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned uh, building out the communication strategy and, and the marketing. So, what were the like initial steps going from a very deeply technical product with these mathematicians and and all these these models and and to actually create then a story and and a product and and a really well known brand? Yeah, absolutely. And just to pick up on your previous point, I, I mean. I agree. Like I, people used to ask me, was I a teacher or a translator? But when I, <laughs> so it was always kind of like, oh, you're a teacher. You, you studied French. Um, so I, I agree. I think it, it, it would be great to sort of start changing that mentality. In terms of building up the brand, I think first off, um, Dark Trace serves over 5,000 organizations um, currently across all industry sectors and also different sizes of, of business. So we're we're working with enterprises that are sort of multinationals with thousands of employees, as well as smaller to medium businesses. And I think I talked about, you know, we were coming into the market with a very different approach. There is no silver bullet to cybersecurity. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, a lot of people will tell you, you know, you can stop breaches. You can't stop breaches, actually. You're, you're, you're vulnerable. And I think we were coming in with a very different message Um, and so I think there's a lot of education that we had to do in the early days to explain a different approach. This wasn't an incremental change and an incremental improvement on an existing approach. It was something very, very different. I think one of the key things um, for us has been to really facilitate our customers to be storytelling around uh, how they use our technology and what are the benefits. Um, in the security industry, the, the customers that we're serving, um, they are a skeptical bunch. Um, they're a demanding bunch, and they have incredibly um, difficult and uh, difficult. You know, it's, it's it's a tough job to be defending your business's intellectual property, their employees. There's a lot of stress that goes with that. And so, um, what we've been able to do is really foster a really great community within the Dark Trace customer community where they're able to share peer-to-peer -peer insights of how this is how this is used, what the value is. Uh, and I think that's that's as equally as important now at the stage we are now as a, a large, large enterprise, but it's certainly very, very important at the early stage. So when you're getting a product out to market, the first thing I would say is get customer feedback early. It can be tempting to try and you know, create the perfect product or what you think is the perfect product, but you need that feedback really early. And that's been really important for us is being able to iterate, 
the product based on customer feedback. And then in terms of what you're asking, in terms of the brand, really allowing, allowing our customers to tell stories uh, and have a platform because actually uh, it's an area that's changing so much. The threat landscape has changed so much in the last decade. It's got a lot more sophisticated and a lot more aggressive in terms of the threats that companies are facing. And so really it's important to have that interchange. We've set up um, you know, forum events where we actually bring um, uh, you know, chief information security officers uh, who are typically our buyers to um, you know, events where they can come together and not just to talk about dark trace, to talk about the problems that they're, they're facing. Um, and, and I think if you can help create those communities and those um, interactions, then you, you get a really great advocate base who are going to do that job really, really well because they want to hear from their peers. Yeah, no, exactly. And it seems like, you know, um, changing the narrative, changing the story, and then then getting your customers to to sing your praises or sing that story. It seems that that that's a very efficient way for for many deep tech companies. We've had some some other type of like similar companies also on the show, and we've talked about uh, getting those first first partnerships, getting getting those first advocates and allies, and and really talking uh, talking for you and and doing the job in that sense for you, and and then taking uh, taking it from there so absolutely yeah we as i said i, I think one of the first events we did was uh, what we call a forum event where we we set up a q a we we invited just people in the industry and we uh, allowed audiences to ask questions and so we just had this really interactive event where we were able to um, talk about our approach, but just really have an emphasis on interaction we had networking afterwards so i think everything you can do to yeah, create that community yeah. is is ultimately good for your brand. Was it hard for you to to get the kind of the first customers on board since you probably believed in your product and knew it was the right approach, but it always seems that, you know, getting the first really like big references, big customers to believe in the story um, is always the hardest. And, and most companies want to buy at the point where someone else has bought because they don't want to be on the hook for buying something that doesn't work, especially uh, with a product like this that could potentially then <laughs> screw it up even more. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's sort of getting that that initial momentum going. It is yeah you know, your first priority as as a, as a as a new business, and you want to lower the barriers as much as possible to kind of getting that first that first customer relationship, which is as good for you as it is for them, right? So it's really a mutual um, relationship that you're building. Um, as I said before, that feedback is absolutely critical. You can't build a product without getting that and getting it early. Um, I think for us, you know, we were founded by, I mentioned mathematicians and the sort of genesis and getting it off the ground was coupling up that group with um, some individuals coming out of the UK intelligence services, GCHQ and MI5 here in the UK, who had direct experience of the cyber threat at a government level, and who'd also worked with uh, large large corporations and and seen the extent to which, um, quite frankly, they were getting infiltrated. Um, And so we had a great team that had a lot of credibility and talked to the problem and so uh, you know particularly on the kind of uh, UK intelligence service and we actually uh, built an advisory uh, council uh, again in quite the early days where we had people really talking to why this approach was so necessary uh, of course this is a critical problem that companies were facing and, and still face and it's an existential problem you're not going to have a business if you know your engineering blueprints are being stolen if you've got competitor, you know, competitors, um, you know, going after, you know, customer databases or whatever. So I think clearly it was a critical demand uh, that we recognized and being able to kind of couple up um, external parties that um, validated the approach was, was really powerful and getting customers, sort of those early customers engaged. Um, the second thing is a very practical thing. We're an artificial intelligence company. Uh, now, today, there's a lot of hype around AI. It's almost used as a marketing term today. Um, that wasn't so much the case when we started, certainly is now. I think we we want, we want we knew as a sort of deep, deep tech company that had a different approach was that at the end of the day, you need to show it working, not just in some sort of like test lab theoretical way. You need to show it working in their systems. And so... 
from a very early point, we um, decided to roll out a, a trial period where we would essentially provide the technology free of charge. We would install it into the customer's environment, whether that was in their data center or in their cloud environment, wherever, wherever they wanted to, to test it. And we go in and we, we basically start looking at, at, at those systems. The way that AI works is it, it goes in and it starts learning what is the normal activity for this business? What's the pattern of life? What's the day-to-day cadence of the employees? And it learns that and develops this sense of what we call uh, self. Uh, if you think about the immune system and the way the human body defends itself, it's very sort of, um, similar in that it's, pre- it's predicated on the idea that you're not going to keep bad stuff outside. Your skin's not going to keep everything out. You're, you're going to have to find and identify uh, bad stuff intrusions um, internally. And so we, we have a similar model where we, we put the AI inside and then we would show them what we found. And I think what was the real test and, and sort of proof of this is that in over 75% of organizations where we were, uh, well, but still today, where we, where we go in and we apply that AI, we're finding uh, threatening activity that that company was unaware of, despite investment in that wall uh, that I talked about earlier, despite having pretty um, a sort of mature approach in terms of the perimeter security. Yeah. And so being able to do that, and of course, there was a cost to us there, but being able to actually you know, put that technology in the hands of our customers um, was really critical in building up that early credibility and, and, and winning those those first customer wins. Yes, and, and probably, you know, money much more well spent than doing billboard ads or Instagram ads for a cybersecurity product with no customers. So I think that's a great way to approach it. And, and many, I think many entrepreneurs and companies underestimate how hard it is to get the first customers and paying customers and how you actually need to approach it. Uh, in the in the way you did uh, most often so um, i think yeah evidently it has been money well spent mm-hmm. so yeah uh, but moving moving down to to the hiring part maybe uh, you work as a cmo and uh, yeah the product is still very uh, deeply technical and uh, you get your customers to to sing your praises of course but how do you do you need to think differently about hiring Uh, other marketeers or copywriters or or your internal marketing team when doing a more technical technical product. Yeah, so Dark Trace today has um, 1,600 employees. So we've, we've certainly done a lot of hiring over the past eight years. Um, I think the first thing to say is hiring is probably the most important thing you can do um, when you're building a business. Um, people are critical and and so really um, understanding what you're looking for and making sure that you communicate that across the business when you get to scale um, is really 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 important for us I think you know we're looking for very bright capable people now clearly in in our Cambridge R&D team uh, we're looking at highly um, skilled um, scientists software engineers in those roles uh, and it's You know they're they're a finite resource and uh, they are the kind of magic team really that I that I think of them as the magic team who are doing the kind of um, amazing engineering work. But of course, across the business, we need those skills to commercialize it and to, to scale scale the business. And so, um, for us, it was about getting skilled, capable people and bright people. But remembering that actually you can learn a lot on the job and in security. We have a massive skills crisis. Actually, we don't have enough people who know secure, cyber security, who are specialists in um, threat investigations and networks. And actually, what we we realized was that a lot of that you can um, you can implement on the job. You can you, we spent a lot of time developing uh, training programs that got people up to speed. And really, what you're looking for when you're you're hiring those people is that potential and that kind of core uh, competency. Um, it can be tempting to sort of look at the ultimate sort of what you want at the end of it and look for those capabilities and look for certain um, degree course. But actually, you're going to be missing a lot of really really good people um, if you're too kind of narrow in what you think you want. So for us, it was about really spotting potential. 
And when you're hire, when you're when you're growing a company, you are hiring your future leaders. Whether that's an entry level position, you need to be really looking and thinking. You know, could this be a future leader? Um, because you're going to need those uh, later down the line. So um, I think that's allowed us to be, um, you know, get really interesting people that perhaps don't fit a particular mould, whether that's, you know, in a commercial role or whether that's in a cybersecurity analyst role. And it really creates a really great culture because you have this culture of continually learning and you open up these really amazing career paths. We have. Um, people who've studied classics and have gone on to actually join the software development team. And those kind of routes that even when I was at university, I would never have, you know, thought that I could be, you know, to do that, to be a software developer would just have been outside of what I would have imagined for myself. Um, but those, we see those career paths um, and we certainly, I certainly see them on my team. Um, so I think believing people's core, you know, uh, capability and they can learn and, and and I've seen that proved out um you know in various departments in dark trace uh we have a bit of a rule at dark trace that you, you want to take a problem back to its first principles you're not rolling out the playbook in fact with tech often there is no playbook you're you're in new territory and so you don't necessarily want someone who's gonna have the management answer or have a, you know um a sort of preconceived idea of how to run a business, you want someone to sort of sit back and think, well, if I took this back to first principles, what, what is the problem here and how can I solve it? And, and often you get the most creative solutions when, you, when you're taking that, that approach. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great approach, especially like the, the idea of, of hiring your future leaders, because it seems like many companies also hire for a very specific need at a very specific time and, and you kind of treat people like you know, disposable assets that you need to switch out at some point to get the next batch of people in to, to you know, fit the that growth stage of the company. And that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for every good hire, you also probably make a bad hire. It's very, very, very hard to, to hire, to be that good at hiring. So then allowing for more mistakes yeah. and, and more development of the job seems like a very intuitive approach. So it, it seems like a, a very good idea. Absolutely. No. I mean, it's, I think one of the joys of kind of seeing a company grow is seeing people grow. And yeah, we've pe we have people on the team that have been with us three, five years and will have had amazing careers where they've, they've learned, they've escalated and uh, they'll be leading teams of their own in that, in that time. So it's, it's really kind of fulfilling to see people develop really exciting career paths with our company. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, what about yourself then? Clearly, you've had to scale as well. You you uh, you were one of the co-founders. You were five people. Now you're 1,600 employees. So how how is your personal growth uh, journey looking? Yeah, I mean a lot of learning. Clearly, I think um, certainly you know the company is, is, has changed uh, a huge amount from when I started. Um, just developing the first website and doing the first kind of events and doing the first kind of collateral that you produce. Um, and obviously running a team, that's very different. Um, I think scaling has been the, you know, the big challenge. And I think it's a cultural challenge, which is how do you make sure that that kind of entrepreneurial culture, which I think is, is important to us, even as we we're a large company is, is maintained when you're not physically there and, and you, you know, you're not going to be uh, able to influence everyone on, on your team in a direct way. Um, so, you know, certainly, get, you know, for myself, it's been really making sure that um, have a really strong uh, you know, leadership team that, that are able to do that in different regions of the world um, and, and, and continually learning. And I think you need to be a little bit humble when you're in a fast growth industry. You won't have all the answers. And, you know, I think even, even now we're looking at new technologies, new, new ways to apply the artificial intelligence that we're really having to rethink, you know, how we sell and how, how, we, how we roll out to customers. And so I think it's about getting that balance right between, um, you know, directing and, and getting, um, you know, getting your, your strategy executed, but also kind of um, being open to be to learning. And I, and I think it's something important for the, for the whole of my team is, is constantly being learning and keeping up with the changes in the market and changes in technology. Um, it's really exciting. Um, obviously, we are now at a really exciting stage in that we 
we have this amazing platform um, that we've achieved through uh, floating the company early this year. And so what we're really excited about is how do we get to the next phase of our growth? And so these milestones are something that um, I know personally, I get a lot of kind of um, sort of energy out of um, in terms of really marking the progress of the company. Um, and I'm really excited about growing, growing dark traces, um, presence into new emerging markets, and also um, really exciting product launches that are going to change again um, the way people think about uh, enterprise security and artificial intelligence. So yeah, I think the wonderful thing about being a tech is you're always learning. You're very rarely sort of resting on your laurels, um, which is a challenge, but it, but it keeps it really exciting. You're never, you're never just executing that same playbook and you've got it right and you just, you know, rinse and repeat. You're, you've got to be on your toes all the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a it's a good mindset. Before we move on to to the flotation and the IPO process, um, thought it would be interesting to discuss also the um, research driven innovation and and research driven companies. And they're still like somewhat uncommon for deep tech companies to achieve, you know, high high valuations such as the one you've achieved and and really to to succeed. So, what do you think are the the most important things to get right in order to foster more of of research uh, driven innovation? I think I guess the first thing to say is that uh, in the in the UK and I think in Europe as well, but certainly uh, particularly in the UK, uh, we have second to none scientific research. Um, we have the ecosystem in terms of the universities and the funding, and of course, it's really important to make sure we maintain that that great support and funding for research. Um, that is the core and the base of which we rely to be able to create companies like Dark Trace. Um, so we do really well on that. Um, and I think we need to continue to, from a government perspective, that support uh, for scientific research. Um, in terms of within our business, um, it's an absolute priority for us to keep innovating. And that's something that it's not just something you do at the beginning and then you launch the com company and then, you know, the, the job is done. Um, we're a deep tech company. We're an AI company at our core that develops solutions for the for a cybersecurity uh, challenge. Um, but we very much see ourselves as an AI company, as a mathematics company at its core. And what we've been able to do is actually within our research and development team in Cambridge, firstly, they are mathematicians. They're not all cybersecurity specialists. We need those core capabilities to be innovative, to rethink problems. Um, and so we have a range of skills and it's very important that we have a range of skills within the R&D team. Um, and then what we've done as well is run sort of parallel teams. So uh, as we get larger, of course, we have a lot of kind of customer uh, yeah, uh, roadmap plans that we want to roll out new new um, improvements and new features for our customers. But in parallel, we have another team, in fact, we have several teams that are working on kind of pure research and innovation. And I think the core there, you know, this isn't my team, but this the core there is giving them the time and uh, the space to think laterally. If you're always just executing on a kind of roadmap, you're not going to give people the kind of time and kind of headspace to think about new, new problems. And I think what's really exciting about Dark Trace is we have an artificial intelligence that learns a sense of self for a company. It's a very fundamental capability, understanding the, if you like, the digital DNA of an organization. And we are conscious that the application of that um, could also be really interesting outside of or beyond cybersecurity. So we are actively investing in our R&T team. We, um, we're increasing its size and we give teams the ability to spend time on sort of how, how we could use this, um, not just necessarily within security, but within other areas of business. Um, and so getting those right people and giving them the space and the encouragement to do that is, is how we, we get to these really interesting new innovations that aren't just kind of adding on a certain track, but actually creating whole new tracks. Yeah, no, that makes makes total sense. 
And what about thinking about global expansion? That's something also uh, as very, you know, very hard often to get right. And and you know, choosing the right markets, setting up the the right teams internationally, getting the the customers. It's it's like starting a company all over again in in a sense until you've done that a few times, and then you again have maybe some references mm-hmm. and and credibility in terms of of opening new markets. Has there been some really like clear learnings on on how you on on, on the way you've approached uh, the global expansion so far? Yeah, I think um, you know we we expanded internationally pr- pretty quickly um, in the first uh, couple of years. We already had close to twenty offices around the world, so it it was it was pretty rapid. And, and so we took the approach of really just. Um, going out, we knew there was demand. We knew this was a fundamental problem. Companies were getting, um, you know, infiltrated and experiencing um, cyber intrusion. So we went out pretty quickly. I think one of the sort of key learnings is is culture is probably one of the big concerns. How do you make sure that it doesn't feel like you're setting up five or six different companies? You, you've got a single company, um, uh, and, and and that's really hard. I think it, 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 again, it comes down to kind of the, the people that you've got setting up. You need to make sure that you really have people that are bought into your culture, that aren't just good at sales or whatever it is that you want them to do there, but actually really are bought into your culture. That spent time um, with with the founding group, uh, and then can build up. Um, that culture in in different regions. So you know, we 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 went to North America and across Europe pretty quickly. Then we expanded out to Asia, and then we we've add, been able to add things like Latin America and, and really exciting new emerging markets. Um, so I think getting getting that leadership in place. We also took the approach that it was really important for us to have centers of gravity in those regions, uh, really strong hubs. Um, so office environments where people can collaborate. And, and get that culture. I think it's really hard at the moment. You know, we, we've gone through a global pandemic, and people haven't been able to do that. And you know, running a remote workforce when you've just started, I think is, it, it's a challenge. I think companies, have, have, some some companies have done really well at that. But I think uh, I think it would have been a challenge for us because we really wanted to make sure that people were meeting and you know whether they were kind of in the field and traveling a lot but there was somewhere to go back to and so we, we we definitely created these kind of regional hubs Singapore for our Asia Pacific business we had you know San Francisco New York becoming kind of key hubs in, in, in the US etc and then making sure we have um, enough clearly interaction um, from the founding team getting out there and spending time in the markets markets are different and I think certainly from a marketing perspective you know understanding where you do need to localize Um, is really important. There's, of course, language barriers that you need to make sure that you're accommodating, but also different business practices. You go to parts of Asia and, you know, your event strategy may not work the same way as it will in Europe um, because of cultural practice. And so you want to make sure that you are, you're, you're sort of translating your culture, but you're also listening to cultural norms and, and getting that balance right. So ultimately, you have a team that are proud of your culture and proud of that kind of HQ uh, sort of link, I guess, that that they have, but also feel that they have the uh, autonomy and, and independence to be able to make make that work um, for the market that they're in. Yeah, no, exactly. And obviously, as you said, the uh, the problem being that global uh, and and being in some ways at least uh, quite the same everywhere helps uh, you don't need to educate the customer you know and, and tell them what the problem is in the same way that with some so maybe other consumer products or or stuff like that so it's probably mm-hmm. a good advantage to have as well um yeah maybe to to close off then to talk a little bit about the the flotation and the IPO process so just in general um How did you start evaluating uh, if the timing was right? Uh, you know, how do you know? When do you know when to to IPO? Is there a perfect time? Well, I think I don't think there is a perfect time. I think it's something that certainly was an aspiration that was shared by you know the leadership team for a long time. We've we've always been very ambitious for the company since its early days, and so it it was on the horizon. And I think the the time was right for us in terms of. Certainly, the threat landscape. Um, you've seen the escalation in, in in attacks really ramp up just in the last year. Ransomware has become almost sort of synonymous with 
cyber attack for a lot of a lot of people. Um, and so it was a really good time to double down. And particularly what the uh, the flotation has done has enabled us to uh, invest and expand our uh, research and development team in Cambridge and get that those kind of innovation projects that I was talking about really just do more and do it quicker. And so it was the right time from a kind of market perspective for us and internally for us to really kind of, um, you know, put the pedal down uh, and start that process. Um, and I think it's been a really uh, interesting time as well to be looking at kind of talent flows and getting the right people on board. Um, so we've been doing a lot of, of, of hiring still, um, uh, particularly within our R&D team um, and so the timing worked for us it's been give, it's given us an amazing um platform um that really gets us to be seen as it sort of kind of it's a, it pegs us in terms of our growth it gets us to that kind of platform where we can sort of get to the next stage and, and the, the, the timing just felt right for us Do you think it increases your credibility in in large larger corporation size? Is it easier for them to buy from a stock listed company than from a you know quote unquote startup? Absolutely, um, no question. I think there is a huge amount of credibility. And what was great about the IPO was our customers' uh, feedback. You know, they're really proud of actually being part of the dark trace journey pre-IPO. Um, and that's really nice when you can take the customers along a journey. You know, those early customers that were trailblazers uh, and really, you know, trying a brand new approach and then coming all the way up to um, to the IPO. It's really validating for that customer community. And so that was that was one of the joys was sort of getting that great feedback. And absolutely, um, you know, you're you're completely correct that 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 credibility is is so valuable in getting um you know expanding more and getting bigger customer wins yeah was there some something uh in the in the process uh, of the ipo that that surprised you something that was um you know an unexpected outcome or something that was harder than you thought or or whatever some anecdote of, of something being surprising well i must say i was slightly disappointed because we were all kind of waiting for the kind of bell to ring yeah. and be in the stock exchange and that kind of big moment and the balloons and And it was a global pandemic and it was very different. So I think um, personally, that was that was a, that was a bit of a shame. But um, uh, and of course, the, you know, the, the, the team that were, were doing, you know, you know, speaking to investors day in, day out, had to do it on Zoom. Um, not how we'd imagined it. Of course, you know, you really want to be kind of sitting with these people, looking into the white of their eyes, talking to them about your business. Uh, And there was a lot of, of, of Zoom fatigue <laughs> by the end of it, um, so that was different, and that was, I guess, a challenge. But it was it was amazing, also, to see how we how we kind of pulled that off virtually. Um, and I think what's really nice about the whole process is certainly as a founder coming through the business and being day in day out, you're kind of in the weeds of your business. And you're just moving forward day, you know, and, and entrepreneurs listening to this will know this. You just, you're constantly just pushing for day by day, week by week. And so for us, it was a great opportunity to just take a step back and look at the business and, and think about the business as an external um, party would. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a moment of pride for us because we get to present um, not just the business today, but also it forces you to present the business tomorrow uh, and show that pathway. Um, and so I think it surprised me, I guess, not kind of our business because I kind of know that very well, but really looking at the amazing sort of future that we have. I think that was really exciting, very motivating for a lot of us to to, to kind of think 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 more deeply about, about that. Um, and, and obviously it was a great moment for our employees as well. Um, I said, you know, again, it was the pandemic, so it was kind of it was a shame that we we could, couldn't get together and, and have that guy, like big party that you know you, you'd, you'd hope that we had, and we did do one later. Um, but um, but an amazing amazing moment for all the employees um, that have been part of that journey for for, for a number of years. Um, so for me, it was just a great moment of pride for that just kind of recognised the last eight years. 
Yeah, I think you know how they moved up the, the all the weddings and the concerts. They should be moving up the bell ringings of the of the all the missed missed uh, flotation bells as well. I think <laughs> that would be more than fair. So maybe, I, th- I think so. Yeah, all in all in a row, one one bell ringing day or something like that. So that would be deserved, I think. Exactly. Yeah. No. Uh, but. Uh, Thanks so much for for uh, joining the Soak by Slash podcast, and it's it's been a blast, uh, really fun talking to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who tuned in, and see you in the next episode again. Bye bye.